we'll get started. Uh, so welcome to the part two of our uh, robotics capstone um, presentations. Uh, this tool is in curve, and they're going to talk more about a spherical robot that they're designing. Uh, so I'll turn it over to our team lead, Daniel, and let them get started. Thank you, Dr. Rutherford. Um, thank you all for being here. We are in curve robotics, and today we'll be talking about our preliminary design. My name is Daniel Cohen, as Dr. Eisenberg said, and I am the design team lead. To my right, I have Gabe Benz, John Sabolsky, Narendra Murhalidran, also known as Naru, and Michaela Stewart. <coughs> Our objective was to design and build a robotic platform for outdoor exploration. The outline for this presentation is as follows. We're going to talk about the design requirements, then go into the preliminary design, We'll cover the internal mechanisms and how they function. We'll talk about the exterior shell of the robot. We'll go into the dynamic modeling that shows that our robot can function next semester. We'll look at the simulations that were developed and the controller. And then talk about the electrical system. We'll then wrap it up with a conclusion and then have questions. I'm now going to pass it off to Michaela who's going to talk about the design requirements. As um, Daniel said, I will be covering our design requirements. These are the framework for our entire project. Um, our primary requirements were the robot shall be built for under $500. We have a very limited budget, so it was a big um, consideration for our project. The robot must be, be able to endure an outdoor environment, be deployable in any orientation, and drive on a flat surface. These um, outline the capabilities of the robot and what we wanted to do. Uh, overall, we wanted to be able to collect the for data as it is a exploration platform and we'll have to house sensors or some other point devices. Um, other primary requirements are that the robotic controller must be able to accept and execute task-based commands. Uh, we want it to be able to, we give it a spot to go to and it'll go. And then the robot must fit through a 32 inch door frame or a regular size door frame here on campus that limits the size of our robot, a bit of the scope. However, it makes it easier to transport him out of the lab to be established. And then the robot must be able to perform outdoor localization. Being able to find where it is supposed to be, especially if you dropped in a unknown territory, it would be, helps with the navigation of the robot. We have things called stretch goals, which we added on to the end of the primary goals. We wanted to be able to meet those primary goals and then have an opportunity to expand upon the capabilities of the robot. Um, here we have a robot shall be built primarily using COPS components. The less amount of manufacturing we have to do, the uh, quicker the project can go and we can save on cost and time. The robot shall have expandable sensing capabilities. We want the robot to be able to be improved upon, adding sensors, adding capabilities and such. The user interface shall be able to transmit commands to the robot. If you don't have a way to talk to the robot, there's no way it's going to be a viable system. So a user interface is very important. The robot must be able to detect and avoid obstacles. If it is out in an unknown area, it needs to be able to navigate its way around the terrain and know its capabilities whether it's going to run into a tree or fall into a ditch. And the robot must be able to self-recharge. This would be good for long-term long -term, uh, missions as the onboard power system may not be capable of going for a long amount of time, but if it had a way to recharge itself, it would be able to be deployed for multiple um, missions and for a longer mission as well. I will now pass it over to Daniel again who will go over our original project. Thank you, Michaela. So during the project, we all had one robot that we were going to design, and then we pitched to the entire class. These are those designs in a brief uh, overview. The first one was Naru's design, which is the sod. The sod utilized four wheels and four motors, allowing it to have uh, good torque capabilities and would be able to self-write itself given his design and his paper that he wrote. 
The next one was mine, which is the linear actuator design. This one had 12 linear actuators, which would be able to push the robot on the ground. Michaela looked at the snake robot, which would be good for tight spots, but at a low, high speed. John looked at a deformable sphere robot, which by using linear actuators in a Carbon 60 format, it would be able to deform itself and then roll over obstacles, even having the ability to roll over a rock. The last design was the pendulum-based spherical robot from Gabe Benz. This utilized a two degree of freedom pendulum on the inside and a spherical shell. By the pendulum rotating on the inside, it, re <coughs> it induced a torque on the exterior shell, allowing it to drive. This is what we show in the dynamics later. In the criteria matrix, we looked at locomotion being the first most important thing. This was because in the past, certain robots in the robotics department haven't been able to uh, meet that requirement, so we focused on making sure the robot could drive. The next one was cost of manufacturing, because we had to be wise about our budget, given the fact that the robotics department split into two teams and two separate robots. We then looked at onboard power. This was analyzed using the number of motors and possibly how much current was, would be drawn in voltage. We then looked at deployability. This was how easy we could deploy the robot into an environment. Would we have to use a car? Would we walk it out? We looked at survivability as well, whether or not it would be a structurally sound design and whether or not it could actually uh, survive in the type of terrain that we're looking for. And then we went on to look at expandability, costs, and the other minor requirements which are at the 10% level. Uh, overall, we determined that the 10% requirements could all be applied to the majority of the robots. The ones at which they had more trouble obviously had a lower score, which can be seen in this figure. When we totaled everything up, we found out that the saw design was the best robot by these numbers. And then right below that was the sphere. The team then decided to vote on what design we would do. We all unanimously voted for the spherical based design from Gabe Betts. This is because we wanted the engineering challenge and we've never seen a robot like this on campus. And there's only been a few of them with the uh, 360 degree motion that we will be looking at. Okay, we'll now cover the internal pendulum designs. All right. I have to cover the entire mechanical capabilities of the system in 10 minutes. So we're going to try this. I'll be talking about the internal mechanisms, uh, all the parts that basically make the robot move, and its primary structural components. So as I, uh, has been stated, we're using a pendulum-based system. Basically what occurs is you change the center of gravity of the robot by moving the pendulum in some direction so that it induces a torque on the outer shell so that the robot can move. This is the primary equation that we use. This basically defines all of the capabilities of the robot. As we're going through this, I'll refer to this several times because this defines what the physical parameters of the robot are in any given situation. So, in a pendulum-based system, there's a couple catch-22s that you have. Since the pendulum is housed internally, the, it is limited in the amount of torque it can produce and cannot exceed what is induced by the outer shell. So we cannot infinitely increase the pendulum like in the case of a Segway or something like that in order to get the maximum torque possible out of the system. Supposedly you would be able to add mass to the end of the pendulum and increase torque, but in doing that, from the, uh, bumpy button, turn up. In increasing that mass, you increase the overall weight of the system so that you increase the amount of torque that's needed. It's exactly like building a rocket. You can add fuel, but then you have to lift more fuel and so on and so forth. So the only other way to go is to increase the length of the pendulum. We are not able to exceed the radius of the sphere, but there is a point in the pendulum length where we have to be very finicky about the length because as much as half an inch can greatly increase or decrease our torque. So we were very, Nazi-like about the length of the pendulum for a long time. Uh, there's several different designs and means of going through the uh, creating a pendulum system. There's a limited range where the pendulum is able to swing sideways only 180 degrees. It should be noted that in all of these it has a full 360 degree range of motion forward, but the side to side motion is what we'll be discussing here. In the limited range you can maximize the length of the pendulum, but we moved away from this design because it could potentially complicate the controller. So we moved away from that. 
these were a couple other design iterations that we went through. What we ended up deciding was to have a fully, uh, full range of motion in both axes of rotation. The mode pendulum driven from side to side and the actual forward motion of the pendulum. It's able to go full 360 in the front, full 360 to the side. This is the final design that we had. It's a complete aluminum structure, two drive motors on either side of the central spar. We have a slip ring assembly, which carries power from the primary batteries in the pendulum up to all the electromechanics, and a secondary drive motor for the pendulum itself. So, for the primary spar, this is the structural backbone of the entire system. Right here, again, as I'll restate, the motors are mounted on either side. This does have a length cost to the pendulum, because they are mounted, per the planes of rotation are perpendicular to each other. The reason we did that, the only other way to get around it would be to mount the motors on the side of the spar, but in doing that, you essentially increase the spar and therefore decrease the length because of the interference with the sphere. The other option we had was to offset the planes of rotation so that they are not completely perpendicular. But again, that had uh, ramifications in the controller, so we moved away from that design. So we have a cost in the pendulum length, which impacts our physical characteristics, but in order to ensure that the robot could control itself, we uh, made that sacrifice. So, the actual design of the spark components itself, uh, what we do is we rely on the material capabilities uh, themselves by using completely water jetted parts. We created a peg and hole system so that we can send in a sheet of aluminum, all the parts come out, and basically all we do is plug them together, and there are tensioning bolts also that hold it together to make sure it doesn't just collapse on us. That makes sure the bolts are in tension, so everything is being used to its maximum capacity in its best situation. The aluminum is also lightweight and fairly portable. So these are the three unique parts in the spar, four parts total. These are the two end motor mounts where the primary drive motors are attached. This side is the side that houses the, <coughs> the drive motor for the pendulum itself, and then this side is where the slip ring assembly is attached. In order to do the analysis of the spar, the two main things we looked at were the tear out of the holes right here and the shear of the pegs themselves. The way we determined what that force would be is based on one of our primary specifications. The ball, the robot has to be dropped from one meter and survive it and continue on with its mission. We used the mass of the robot to find out what the final impact force would be. We then applied that to one half of one side of the spar and found out what the reaction force would be at a single peg. It's an oversimplification and a absolute worst case scenario. But in both of those situations, in either tear out or the share of the peg, we have a margins of safety that are within our range of what we're looking for. Uh, we also applied that force to the spar itself. We use the slip ring side spar because it has the large hole with the larger stress concentration. It also is considered to be the primary load bearing spar, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But in that case, the max stress is fairly high and the MS is a little bit lower than we want to, so this part could potentially be redesigned to improve that margin of safety a little bit, but at this point it does uh, meet our requirements and won't be destroyed when it's dropped. So the slip ring assembly itself, this is the primary load bearing joint of the system. We have a short stub uh, shaft that goes into a bearing and then the slip ring is going through the center. The reason we had to use this uh, slip ring it's not a through hole, it does not have a through hole, which would have been ideal for this kind of situation because it gives uh, better advantages for how the shaft is designed. We couldn't afford a slip ring that's an actual ring. So we had to design a shaft that has a through hole to allow the slip ring to insert into. <coughs> on the opposite side, on the other side of the structural spar, we also hold the drive motor. The drive motor we did not expect to be terribly load bearing, so that's why this is the load bearing half. Uh, because the shaft is basically a plug into the side, and if it has any transverse uh, motion at all, it can potentially become dislocated from the spar and the pendulum would fall off. So we had to ensure that the spars did not have enough flexure to allow basically the pendulum to pop out. We went through this, we had uh, 0.8 inches to actually work with, our maximum deflection is 0 0.09, so we're well within range there. The pendulum itself, the, it is aluminum, it has the same kind of manufacturing, manufacturing design as the spar, the peg and hole. It houses two lead acid batteries which power the entire robot. We're using lead acid because it is heavy. 
and power dance. We needed as much mass at the end of the pendulum as we could possibly get. Ideally, the entire robot's mass would be at the end of the pendulum, but with the omnidirectional design, you can't move all the electromechanics down to that end. So, with this situation, the way it's set up right now, we have a maximum torque of 107 inch-pounds, with the center of gravity located 9.5 inches from the point of rotation, and the total weight is 11 pounds. What we did was using that previous equation that I originally said is the master of all for this uh, robot, we determined uh, that in a static case where the ball is basically leaned up against an obstacle and it's holding its arm out perpendicularly, the maximum obstacle size it can go over is about a quarter of an inch. We verified this with this jury rig test rig just to make sure that our math wasn't uh, playing with us and it was in that realm. So for the static case, that's what we're looking at. It can't hardly go over much of anything. However, when you put the ball into motion and let it roll and contact the obstacle, impact the obstacle, and let its momentum carry it over, in that situation, the maximum obstacle that we're predicting is 3.73 inches. The issue with this is it's highly dependent on sphere deflection, the overall shell deflection. So it's something that really cannot be verified until the system is built and we know how well it was manufactured and what the maximum deflection is of the shell at that time. So this is our prediction. It doesn't quite meet the requirements uh, theoretically, but it's something that cannot be uh, set in stone until it's actually built. Uh, for the incline, our specifications uh, said that we should meet a 15 degree incline. We weren't able to do that because an incline is basically a static case. In a static case, it can't go over much. The maximum we're able to get out is 11 uh, degrees, which doesn't meet our requirements, but that's the sacrifice we made for the controller in limiting the torque in that way. Uh, and just to be thorough, we did a quick analysis on the pendulum to make sure that it could survive the own torque that it's creating. Obviously it does, it's a pretty uh, hefty chunk of aluminum. The motors themselves, once we knew the torque, 107 inch pounds that we had to meet, we were able to start choosing our motors. The primary defining factor in these was actually cost. Any kind of a motor that we need uh, has to have this RPM in order to meet our forward velocity requirement, and of course the torque that I've defined before. The reason we use the Wonder Motors, the large ones on the left here, is because A, we have one in the lab already that we're able to use, and they have a very high RPM and a very high torque. They're difficult to control and because they're not very high precision motors, but that was a, another trade-off that we had to make. The Pitman itself, this is a very expensive motor, but again, since it was in the lab, we were able to use it. It actually comes in a little bit under the RPM. So in particular directions, we are not able to meet the forward velocity requirement that we were looking for. Going from side to side, if it's trying to turn sideways, it cannot go the maximum one meter per second. So, that requirement is slightly missed in that, but it's something that we can't achieve because we cannot afford 200 extra dollars for two extra RPM. Other than that, it does have the torque that we need. Overall, the cost of all the internal mechanisms at this point is $124. This is the list of all the purchased parts that we have to deal with. Uh, this leaves the other uh, $375 for the electronics and other expensive sensing that we have to use to make sure that, the, again, the control of this robot is well uh, well done. I'll now hand it off to Michaela to uh, talk about the actual sphere design itself. Thank you. I will now talk about our spherical geometry and the manufacturing. The shell structure is made out of six ribs with an internal circumferential, circumferential hull coop for um, added stability in the centers, and two drive wheels on either end that attach itself to the um, interior pendulum. The robot itself is about 32 inches in diameter, which fulfills the requirement for keeping it under and about 32 inches in diameter for going through, the wall, or going through doorways. Excuse me. The shell pieces on um, the outside, the ribs will be made out of e-glass epoxy wet layup that will be molded onto either a carved out mold of the right shape or a inflated beach ball will stiffen in some way so that it can hold the weight of the layup. Uh, this geometry is really difficult as it is both laterally curved and along the long ways curved to get as much of a sphere full shape as you can. The 
aluminum, or the dry wheel and the internal soap control hoop are all made out of aluminum to add with the, the strength of the pendulum and for lightweight. The rib geometry is based off of the shape called a loon, which cartographers use to transfer 2D maps into gloves. Uh, so 3D and 2D. The shape is 16 inch thick and encompasses 60 degrees of the sphere from its center. It has nine 316 inch holes for fasteners. There will be fasteners attached to the internal hoop and then on either end. The ones on the ends are quarter turn fasteners so that they can be easily detached and reattached so that we can remove the half of the shell so that it's to get to the material. The driver geometry is a four inch diameter drive wheel and that attaches to our ribs and is a fourth inch thick. This also houses faster holes for it to go all the way through and attach to both the ribs and drive wheel and then the center hole is where it attaches to the hoop. The hoop geometry is in two half arches which each will have three of the six bars on them so that you have two separate hemispheres that you can attach and detach, and detach from the interior mechanism. It is about an inch um, wide and 0.1 inch thick. Depending on what we actually end up finding, it might change. But at the moment, these are the dimensions I was working with for static analysis. And the flat length of them are 50.2 inches plus or minus a little bit more for actually connecting them to each other on either end. Um, a preliminary ANSYS analysis, I looked at both a static case and a applied force case. The applied force being if it impacts an object or if it's dropped. The max deflection that was shown in the static case was 0 0.004 inches and the applied force was 0 0.02 inches. So both were well within ranges of the requirement of a maximum deflection between the pendulum and the shell. The maximum easy stress just in the fasteners, what I looked at was, for static case, was about 1,700, and then the fasteners, uh, 8,462 PSI. Um, both Both stresses were within the capability of the fasteners, and there's now no more physical testing might be needed and better specs, but at the moment it looks like the fasteners will not shear um, when dropped or when just supporting the pendulum itself. I used a force of about 200 pounds, which was based off of a estimate of games for dropping it from about a meter. A little bit less than what, we, um, what he actually worked with, but it was good enough to at least improve the concept. Um, our, my manufacturing budget, a lot of the pieces and parts will be taken from the machine lab, including the aluminum, e-glass, and many Vista permanent rivets. Um, I am looking at these quarter turn fasteners, and that is the pretty much the only budget part, or part of the budget that I have part, and it's kind of a hefty fee, so I'm negotiating for samples. <laughs> um, I will now pass it off to Dan, who will go over the dynamic model. Thank you, Michaela. As she said, I'll be covering the dynamic model. The first part of the dynamic model was to determine what we we're going to use for our quarter frame. So clearly laid out here, we have all the quarter frames that we're going to use. We started off with the inertial axis, which can be seen here in black. And then we determined that we would go to a, a sphere fixed frame, which can be seen with the subscript S, which is the next black frame. We then would go to the first ballast or pendulum frame. This is subscript, B, uh, super, <coughs> excuse me, superscript B1 which is in blue. We then would make a rotation alpha 1 through the x-axis 
which would allow us to get to that next pendulum. Going to the next uh, frame, which would be the second ballast, or B2, we would go through a rotation of alpha 2 through the y-axis. It's important to note that these axes are aligned, which allows us to help out the controller along with uh, the ease in the dynamic process when we had to recalculate this multiple times. So rather than writing uh, three or four scripts, we wrote one script and were able to change this one slightly. Uh, like I said, we made a rotation to get to the sphere fixed frame. This is ITS, the rotation B, theta, psi, respectively, X, Y, and Z. We then were able to get to the B1 using the rotation in the X with alpha 1, and then to B2 with the rotation in Y with alpha 2, excuse me, alpha 1, then alpha 2. Our state vector that we used is gamma, which is going to be our displacement in our X, our displacement in our Y, the rotation phi, theta, and psi, which we use to get to the sphere fixed frame, and then alpha 1 and alpha 2 for the respective pendulums, pendulum 1 to pendulum 2. The assumptions that we used, we assumed that we had a rigid sphere and all the systems were rigid. We had three bodies, the sphere, the first pendulum, and the second pendulum. If that's the case, then the sphere cannot be formed the way that we, the analysis showed, but this is completely fair. This is what we normally assume in robotics. If that's the truth, then we will use the assumption that we have one contact point with the ground. Additionally, we're going to have a no-slip condition. When we chose our state vector, we also noted that we had to use the no-slip condition, and as a result, a fapping constraint had to be used, where we have a constraint matrix A of gamma times the derivative of the uh, gamma vector. It's important to note that the, cons the constraint forces on there are going to do zero work. On your handout, if you're following along, you'll see a diagram that has a sphere in a 3D world that has a coordinate system of IB and IS omega I. <laughs> Using that, we were able to look at how we can actually drive in a plane. This was based off of the perpendicularity of the, uh, <clears throat> the linear velocity and the rotational velocity of the robot. Of course, the linear velocity and rotational velocity of the sphere itself is going to be perpendicular, but when we transform them into the uh, inertial axis, we can look at the components and how they play out with uh, x dot and y dot, which is our velocity in the x direction and y, which can be seen right here. It's comprised of our uh, derivative of our gamma vector and the gamma. As a result, we can pull out our uh, state derivative, or gamma dot, and then bring everything on to the other side. Once that's done, we have our constraint matrix, which we needed for the Fapton constraint and to assume the no-slip condition. Use, utilizing the cons uh, constraint or the Lagrange equation with our constraint matrix, we were able to find the forces on the system in the coordinates, which would be x, y, phi, theta, psi, and alpha 1, alpha 2. Uh, most notably, there is going to be no forces on x, y, and phi, theta, psi. They'll only be on alpha 1 and alpha 2. Then we could utilize from the uh, handout that we gave you, the system mass matrix, which is A, theta, <coughs> excuse me, H, then the vector of Coriolis and centripetal truth, which is D, we then added in the, the frictional forces, which would be on the pendulums, and then the vector of gravitational forces. Once again, it's important to note that we're going to use our constraint equation. And additionally, we have our A matrix right here being transposed times lambda, which is our Lagrange multiplier. When we take the derivative our, uh, when we take the derivative of our constraint equation, and then bring it along with the uh, second derivative of our <coughs> dynamic model from here, we have this equation. When we bring this matrix over to the other side, and we can, we can look at the gamma double dot, we can find the accelerations on the systems. Once that's done, we can do a numerical fourth order runga cut integration, which will allow us to get all the way up to the displacements of the robot. This is what was absolutely critical in finding our simulation and actually determining whether or not the robot was functioning. 
I'm now going to hand it off to Maru, which is going to talk, who's going to talk about the simulation and testing. All right, so we simulated the, uh, we modeled the dynamics of the of the robot that Sanya has just spoken about, and we use those dynamics in a simulation program to verify the system to make sure the robot will function. Here we have a video of uh, an initial test condition where the pendulum is held up at a 90 degree angle. We're going to release it without any control input to see what the robot does. And as expected, the robot, the, pen, the pendulum falls down, the robot moves it accordingly to make sure the pendulum is as slow as possible. And again, we tested a condition where alpha 2 was set to 5 or 2, and it's expected to do the same thing, but in the positive x direction. And as you can see, it does. Finally, to see if the motors were modeled, well, the force were modeled, we tried applying a constant torque on actuator 1 of 1 Newton meter. And as you can see, that causes the pendulum to uh, be lifted forward and the robot rolls. And now I'll talk about how we designed the controller for the robot and the challenges we face with that. First of all, let's go over some of the simplifying assumptions. Now, this contradicts the assumption Daniel made for modeling the dynamics, but for the controller, we assumed it to be a two-body system where we have a sphere and the pendulum. Now, this assumption actually doesn't violate too many things because the second body in the dynamics is the, spar, is, is the main spar, and the center of gravity of the spar is the same as the center of gravity of the sphere. So when, we're, when we derive the equations for the controller, we just assume we had a sphere with all the mass in the center, which technically includes the mass of the spar, and then the pendulum that the sphere can, the robot will move in any direction. Secondly, we assume a no slip condition, and that the vector of Coriolis and centripetal forces is negligible. Now, this is only negligible if the robot is moving slow enough, and when we did some simulations, we found that if we're moving at or under our maximum operating speed of one meter per second, the vector is negligible. The controller did account for frictional forces, and I'll come to that in a little bit. Finally, we, want, we assume the robot accelerates in the direction the pendulum points. Now, if from the previous assumption the robot's moving very slow, that is a very viable assumption. I mean, if the robot wants to move in that direction, it moves the pendulum in that way, it starts rolling in that direction, it accelerates there. Now over here, we have, we have two images used to get the equations. Now the first one is a top view of the, of the robot. Now please know that we're, we're not <coughs> considering how the robot is oriented. The Euler angle speed data inside do not matter for these images. There's a robot in the top view, and that's your inertial frame. And if you want to accelerate in the direction of the vector AB, you move the pendulum in that direction. We call that angle beta 2. Now, if you make a cut along that direction and simplify this into a one-dimensional one rolling system, we can look at it from the side perpendicular to the cut, and we have this image. So the pendulum is lifted an angle beta 1 from the vertical. This induces a torque about the center of the robot, which in turn creates a force in that direction. It's a moment due to the torque, and because there is a no slip condition, we have the reaction force exactly equal to the uh, the reaction reaction from the moment, which causes the robot to accelerate in that direction. So over here we have a few equations that we've der derived over here. Um, actually, the equations, if you're following on, on the handout, equations 2.1 to 2.3 uh, will show you how we got these two equations. This is fairly uh, simple. We just did the sum of forces equals zero in the forward direction because it's along the cut. Now this is the interesting part. To connect the task space and the joint space system, we assume the robot, without considering its, its actual orientation, and then we have the robot when we consider the orientation. If I want to accelerate in that direction, I move the pendulum in that way. So we got that from a rotation matrix about z of by the angle beta 2, as we saw earlier, and then about the x-axis by an angle beta 1. Now, there are more equations on the paper if you're following around, uh, along and you want the derivation, but we ended up with this equation where we calculate r, which is a function of alpha 1 and alpha 2, in terms of the, Euler, uh, of the transformation matrix from the inertial to the sphere frame, and the rotation matrix uh, from beta 1 and beta 2 that I just talked about. And using that, we generalize that r 
by making a three axis rotation instead of just a two or alpha one and alpha two. But we we derive these equations so that the third angle about the z-axis is essentially ignored, or it cancels out. And we found e uh, equations for alpha 1 and alpha 2 desired. Those are the actuator angles. So we found the angles we need to move the, pen the robot's pendulum in to get the robot to accelerate in the direction and magnitude of acceleration we wanted to. Now we split the dynamics of the system into the zero dynamics and the actuator dynamics. The top Upper section over there, as Daniel already mentioned, the forces applied by the robot on the x, y, phi, theta, and psi coordinates are essentially zero. The robot is only applying forces on the actuators, alpha one and alpha two. We can we solve these equations for gamma one double dot and plugged it into and substituted it into the second equation, and we found this. At, we simplified the dynamics of the equation into that form. And this is called partial feedback linearization. And this allows us to simulate or compute the torque and find out exactly how much forces or torques we need to apply to the motors to get the robot to meet a desired actuator angle. Again, the, the derivation for these equations are on the handout that you, you've received. And over here, we just have a simple PD controller where KP and KD are determined by the natural frequency and the critical damping rate, or the damping ratio you want for your robot. Now we put them all together to get the controller of the robot. Now this section over here is, I haven't discussed this earlier, but this section actually just takes it in the x and y desired coordinates, so your desired waypoint, and computes the velocity the robot needs to move in to get to that waypoint. The second part of the controller is another PD controller, computes the accelerations. We decompose those into U and V, which are the or x and y components of the initial frame of the desired acceleration. Once it computes that acceleration, we can plug it into the equations we went over previously to calculate beta 1 and beta 2. And then we move everything into joint space where we compute R and then the desired alpha 1 and alpha 2 angles. There's another PD controller that we just saw and then we have our computer torque controller. On finding the forces, we go through robot dynamics and pull out all the feedback components for the robot. And um, here's a simple flow chart we just used on the controller to test this. I'm powering on the robot calibrates the IMU and then waits for a good acknowledgement command. Once a user interface sends that command, it reads the next command, parses the command, and then sees what kind of command it is. Then a stop command will stop the robot. If it's a command to set the navigation mode, we can either set it to route mode or manual operation mode. If it's a command to set the waypoint, well, the robot sets the waypoint. And if it's a manual input command, it goes straight into getting the values of U and V, which are the components of the desired acceleration, and going to the sensors and running the controller to achieve that desired acceleration. Now, if, if, you're, if you're not receive, if you didn't receive a command, the robot got, goes into root mode, or it sees if it's in root mode, and checks if you've reached a waypoint. Now, that's computed by seeing how far you are from the next waypoint. If you're within the waypoint distance uh, tolerance, you switch to the next waypoint, or you stay on the same target waypoint. Now, using that, go back here, it does this to compute the desired accelerations, that's compute U and V, and then it reads the sensors and runs the controller. It also continuously sends telemetry information back to the user interface so the operator can keep track of the robot. Now here we have a video of the robot performing waypoint navigation. This was a test on the simulator we developed. And the yellow circles are the waypoint reach tolerances the robot is required to make, and the green arrow points to the target waypoint. As you can see, the robot moves straight to the waypoint. It does not need any steer or driver steer controller. This is the advantage of a complete omnidirectional control. You can get that spherical robot to turn in any direction you want to go straight to where you want it to go. And now the user interface. Over the course of the semester, we also developed a user interface which pulls up a map uh, some imagery. Now here we have imagery of the campus where that's a robotics lab and there's AC1. We're, we're able to use the map interactively to set target waypoints on the map and have the robot follow those waypoints. Now the user interface has other uh, functionality that it sends to the robot. You can do things like inserting waypoints, appending waypoints to the end of the end of the route, deleting waypoints, or modifying waypoints. You, can, you also have function manual input functions such as go forward or go left, 
You can have a joystick, you can actually just compute the desired acceleration vector based on where the joystick points. <clears throat> now, in conclusion for the controller, we found that the novel propulsion system designed by Team Incurve is functional. We've modeled the dynamics, we've designed a controller, and we found that it will work the way we need it to. And secondly, the control system is capable of accepting waypoints, which isn't task-based, converting them into joint space variables, and navigating to those desired task-based commands. I will now pass it on to John to talk about the electrical systems. All right, I'll be covering the electrical diagrams. Our electrical system is set up as our relationship, our processing unit, our Wi-Fi interface, a GPS unit, the IMU, and we have motor units. All right, power regulation unit, we're using sealed lead acid batteries at a rate of 12 volt and 4.5 amp hours each. We're running them in parallel to increase the capacity, and that will generate about 108 watts. We're using switching regulators because they're more efficient than linear regulators, and they don't produce as much heat. And a little bit more efficient is always good. It expands our capacity. And we're using 10 watts for the Beagle Bone. Our, our GPS is using 82.5 milliwatts. Same amount for the IMU. 1.75 watt for the optical encoders. Those are the second, third major current draw. And of course, our motors. Overall, we're expecting to use approximately 102 watts of power, so a little bit under. However, we will be looking for ways to reduce power usage down by either getting better motors that are more efficient and looking at better ways to detect the motor's position. All right, I just probably show this again, and there's a picture of our regulators. We have the PTPC01, that'll be for all the small ones. It'll provide a max of half an amp. While the NLM25X series is a dual chip series that comprises up to three amps with active heating. And it also allows us in the future if we put solar panels on to actually charge our batteries as it's a step up and step down to work. Moving on to our processor unit, we had pre-low specs based off an MSP432, which is a ARM-based chipset built with the low power capacity. Uh, low power capabilities of the Texas Instruments MSP series of chips. All right, the Beagle Bone Black, from which we have all. However, there's numerous other boards like the Raspberry Pi, the Intel Edison, the Galileo, the Odroid C1 Plus. There's many on the market, many more being developed every day. All right, moving on to our Wi-Fi adapter, we need to be able to communicate with our interface and our users. So. Pretty much, I took the list of all the acceptable adapters for Wi-Fi for the BeagleBone, looked them up, researched, and determined that the Netgear N1500 Wi-Fi adapter is the best one. There has been reported in the past with the BeagleBone that the HDMI interferes with Wi-Fi. So, we need to have an extension, which just combines with a dock, which allows us to actually move it away from the batteries toward the edge of the shell increasing more signal can get out. We also are using an Adafruit Ultimate GPS breakout kit. For the GPS, during my research, most of the modules are pretty similar spec, price, with all the couplings for the cables and antennas. So we just picked this one because the low price has everything you need without having to just like, oh, did I get an SNA or a UFL adapter? Oh, I got the wrong one, I need to reorder. All right, moving on. Probably the most important features of our control system is the BN0055 IMU board. This is a relatively new package that combines space ground, a Cortex M0 processor to control the accelerometer, gyroscope, and the magnetometers. And the best about this is it draws all the data in from the sensors and it fuses it together on its own and just sends us, say, a quaternion or a set of oil anchors along with all the other raw data, and it allows us to set the gains, the thresholds, for like, hey, we'll pass the low frequency stuff through. It's completely customizable and programmable for what we need and what we can anticipate in the future. It's also a very small package, which is also a very good. Our motor controller, we're using a Victor November Hotel 25 Sierra Papa 30 motor control. This is an automotive grade controller, you know, for your windshield wipers any other heavy duty things. So they can accept 
noise voltage in up to 41 volts, and it'll output 5 to 16 volts before the under voltage and over voltage protections will shut the controller down. On top of having the under and over voltage as a built in thermal shutdown, say for an open uh, correction, a short circuit condition, or it gets too hot because you decide to put the 30 amps through it, which you can handle at peak, but it needs active cool. And built in current sensing, current sensing so we can feed back to the beagle button and say, hey, this is where our motors are actually drawing. You can send it to the user, like, oh, hey, this is running more. We may have to send it to the tech shop to get more. Our optical encoders are the one of the few things we cannot buy on our own because of our space limitations with the geometry of the shell and also with motor mount. So those we built ourselves. We're going to use, uh, right now, an optical encoder with a slotted gate interface. We will have a rotating disc attached to the motor and the size that we can allow without having interference with the shell or the pendulum or the spar. And we run through basically a photo gate, match pair, a matched LED and photo transistor. Hey, can I see the, the LED? You can see the transistor, or correction, vice versa. The, the transistor can see the LED. Yes. Oh, we can't. Something's passed through. We can count that for the pulses. Our budget, we have the Beagle Home Black in the robotics lab. We have, we're going to have to order everything. And there's some cheaper sites out there, but they're all relatively the same. So these are the main ones. We took advantage of Amazon Prime to take advantage of the free shipping and handling. And we built a budget for $293 for our electronics. And all other miscellaneous stuff like resistors, capacitors, we're going to use uh, for the bank stock that we have available. In conclusion, I'll pass it off to Daniel. Thank you, John. So for the conclusion, we are $83 under budget, actually. However, we cannot go over the 15 degree incline, but we are close and can be improved with better motors and with more money and time. We cannot traverse the four inch obstacle, but we are once again close to that. Uh, does this impede us on the outdoor driving abilities of the robot? Uh, not as much as you might think, because we're only slightly below that. We can still have good omnidirectional capabilities, and we can go over small obstacles, like small rocks. We can go over bumps. So if we were on campus, we could go from grass to the gravel, and then back to curve, or something like that. The four inch obstacle height is actually the approximate height of a curve on campus. So. Additionally, we were not able to detect and avoid obstacles, but this was a stretch goal and it was a far-fetched one at best. So we are still optimistic that we can do this, but we are not uh, putting all our eggs in that basket next semester. We are going to focus on making sure the robot will drive. It can be something that is gonna stay around in the department. We also cannot recharge. This is once again, another stretch goal. Um, we will look at it again next semester, but we do not believe it's capable of, uh, of that because of the shell. It is gonna be completely enclosed of the composite. There will be no sunlight that comes through, so we won't be able to do that. Next semester, we'll have to look at the internal temperature of the robot. Uh, we were not able to determine what exactly uh, the temperature was gonna be this semester, but we did look at what components might fail first. So we have an idea of exactly what we need to look at. Uh, we'll make sure that we're in our press gate environment, which is what we specified earlier in our requirements. And then we will test this condition every time we drive. Uh, in the requirements section, we said that we we're gonna have a one hour drive at uh, one meter per second. We're going to make sure that this is functional for that. Uh, that's additionally why we were able to take off the panels in case overheating did become a problem we could at least salvage the robot in a worst case scenario. The semester review, we have a dynamic model and a simulation. This was uh, incredibly important in our work and is gonna drive us next semester to work even harder. We developed a working controller which we can improve upon next semester and we can put onto uh, a different system. Currently, there is one computer that is using this control algorithm. We are going to move it over to uh, a few other ones. We have a complete uh, preliminary design and CAD. 
that was done in the past few days and is completely done. The initial structure of analysis was also completed. Uh, all the components that we looked at are have they have positive margin of safety, and nothing in the robot currently is going to fail uh, on any of our tests. We have the preliminary budget, and we are under budget on that, and we have the complete bomb list. So if we want to, tomorrow we could purchase all items. They are all available on their respective websites, and we could get them. Are there any questions? Have you guys have been working on this project for full semester now. What do you think are the biggest risks to your success in this project? Well, one main risk that we looked at was making sure that the controller was going to um, play nice with what we were going to design. Uh, that's the reason why we went with the 360 degree for every degree, uh, every pendulum, was because if we started up the robot and we flipped negative sign on programming or something, it could potentially damage itself, which is the exact opposite of what we want to happen. We want to be careful with the control system, but accidents do happen, and we want to make sure that that's the one thing that doesn't fail is we program the robot, we, it crashes into itself, and then we have no robot after that. That's the problem. Um, there's a few other ones. Uh, Gabe, would you like to add to that? No, you covered. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> On your slot, it's on your sheet. Okay. Yeah. Just one of you. No, Ru, would you like to? <laughs> so we have a few differentiated or derivative blocks right before that. When you differentiate some position, or if you have noise from your sensors, that would create a lot of spikes and high frequency. So if you have low, low pass filters, drop that. And maybe one other little bit deeper question is computer torque approach. Yes. Any potential, along with today and the prior questions, any risks maybe associated with that? Yes. The, uh, to actually use a computer torque controller, you need to know the dynamics of the system. You need to know all the dynamic parameters. And you need to be able to get your state vector. Now, we have sense, as John talked about, we do have sensors to get us that data, and we've also developed an observer model to get our steam vector from the sensors. However, there could be a lot of noise in there, and we're, we're not entirely sure what would happen if these noise on the bottom end. So mainly, get, uh, the problem, if we do face any problem, it would be properly get, getting all the dynamic parameters of the robot. Go to the next slide. So, can you explain a little bit better what is the difference between manual input, uh, manual mode, input receive, uh, read commands? So there are so many inputs, outputs. Yes, there are. I'll, I'll explain. Actually, can I have the? It's very confusing. Yeah. Okay, so. Now this is essentially a switch command to see what the command is. Now you, you wanted to find the difference between manual input and? Manual mode. And manual mode, okay. So the robot is, is expected to have two operation modes. Can be in a waypoint navigation mode or a manual input mode. Okay. In the manual input mode, the uh, operating way, waypoint is the route mode. Okay. Yes. Okay. It, it's called route mode, yes. Okay. Okay. So you have manual mode and route mode. Mm -hmm. okay. in, now if the, if the operator is sets the robot to be in manual input mode, you can actually use a joystick or the arrow keys on this keyboard to control the robot. Okay. Now, what that does is when you go over here, it actually just oh, gets in the UMV values. Alright. Okay, it sets the UMV values, which are your desired acceleration. So, if I move the joystick, let's say, forward to the left, you get something like negative one, negative one, or one, negative one. Now, if you're on route mode, that actually follows the waypoints. Now, the user the operator through the user interface can set waypoints using the waypoint command, and when the robot is in route mode, it follows these waypoints. So suppose you are in main mode. Mm -hmm. So when you want to just set one. There's one? Yeah. 
Okay, this is a command. This means the command that the robot just read is a command to set the navigation mode. Okay. Now the navigation mode can be either route mode or manual mode. Okay. So that's what it is. And the other question is, uh, when you set UAV manual mode just by reading the, I don't know, I don't know the, the angle of the joystick. Mm -hmm. It could either be the angle of the joystick and or the in what, When you are in route mode, then you do a uh, compute UAV. Yes. So this is your... This is, can I go back to the previous slide? No. <laughs> Still a bit. No. That's <laughs> but that's what that does. Okay. You get your desired waypoint, and then from your actual waypoint, you compute the desired acceleration to get this. Okay. Uh, then on slide 28, are you using metric or English in this project? These uh, <laughs> four. For all the dimensions of the system and its actual physical capabilities, they are all in English. Okay. Uh, I would use English everywhere because of the oh. situation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Slide 29. Next slide. Uh, so what kind of aluminum are you using? Because 32 KSI is already quite a bit of stress for aluminum. Yes. So what kind? So yeah, this was a standard uh, value for structural aluminum is what we used. So that was the, the basic value. The maximum, uh, the Oh, with maximum the stress, stress, you mean the max, the heat stress for that material? Yes. So it's not the maximum stress you read from your analysis? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Okay. That is the maximum stress from the analysis. That is the value from the ANSYS analysis. Uh, we compared it to yield stress. So we because are... Because the 6061 has a 35 KSI, this has to be a really high strength. It's a higher value. It is higher. Okay. Uh, higher value. Higher value. 39. 39? Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, either metrics or English. Yeah. Meter per second in velocity. And, uh, yeah, the original specifications yeah. were written in metric, uh, yeah. but then as we went through the actual part selection, it, the yeah. conversion at every fine. single part was yeah. not necessary. 44? Yeah. Um, I have a question here about the fasteners. Are, are those holes going to be countersunk or are, are those fasteners going to be, so is the shell really smooth or are going to be like small? Ideally it's going to be as smooth as possible and then have some sort of texture to increase the coefficient of friction. The fasteners I'm looking at will either be uh, countersunk or uh, just very low profile okay. on the edge of the part so that it does not interfere so as much with the and, and then when you have the, all, all the shares or the loops, if you will, uh, mounted, how are you going to mount the last one? Because you cannot work on the inside. So are you That's why we did a hemisphere. So the two hoops are, you actually attach it to the hoops first, okay. perhaps, okay. and then Fasteners are able to be um, attached from the outside, okay. and then you can put the other one and other half on top with the spar inside and attach them from the outside, and then you attach finally the last the two hoops together. Mm -hmm. And so then, when we want to get into the inner mechanism, we would detach half of the fasteners from one half and flip it off, and you'd be able to go into the inner workings. Or you can even just take away one of them if we made the fasteners go all the way around the center spar. But I, with the budget constraints, I looked at just keeping the the, inch, the center um, fasteners as permanent, okay. and they would be just two pieces. And the uh, last one would be seven. Just as a side note, this is not a dynamic analysis? No. Okay, so because you, it's, they are both static analysis. Yes. Okay, so the second one is just you model and... Uh, I added just the force, a force on one of the, okay. as like uh, but simulating it in Yeah, it would be nice since you have this shed to actually write a static a, a, a dynamic analysis, an actual dynamic analysis mm -hmm. to see how the, uh, the, the, the modes of the shed shed are going to be because yes. if you have an impact you may have some kind of resonance in the, in the system. I actually
actually, as I was thinking of how the shell was going to be built, did look into the library at vibrations of shell structures, um, the right, right, cool. membrane stresses and stuff like that, and I plan on implementing for those types of tests in the next semester. I'm going to have a bit more time. Thank you. Nice job. Just another future, yeah, I think you're losing 40% of your team to graduation. <laughs> And this is a pretty ambitious project. How do you plan to divide up the labor next month? Well, once we have all the code from uh, that the team worked on on the central location, um, hopefully Naru actually will be able to help us next semester. Um, he's going to be in Daytona working in graduate school, and then Gabe will be graduating, so he will not be on project anymore. But we should be able to still contact Naru if there is any issue. Um, I'll be taking mostly the control system and a little bit of the electrical, depending on uh, what happens. Uh, Michaela is going to look mostly at the structural side of things. Um, um, of course, if she wants, she can work with us both. And then uh, John is going to take most of the electrical. Uh, of course, he's going to also help everyone else in the group. And it's going to require uh, every ounce of effort to complete these tasks. But as I said before, we're going to focus on the robot driving because we feel it's the most important. So if we do have to sacrifice something next semester, we're going to do that so that we can get a driving robot in our detailed design at the next presentation. Make sure you get all the information like you guys have for the mm -hmm. and you just, I mean, if you're going to grad school and you're taking full pro classes, you may not find one. He's got a deadline. He doesn't have a grade on the line. So you may not meet deadlines that you need him to. Think of it as an unpaid consultant. <laughs> 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 you can the $83 for well, you can oh. <laughs> <laughs> One more question here. Would you like to sign based on the size of the obstacle. You can basically sub out this entire eight cosine term for the 15 degrees when you go back to the slide that you originally on. You change that for the, uh, the degree of the incline and you plug it straight into that equation and you can determine what the torque required is, which is of course this and then what the actual is. So down to my question, you use the same calculation? I've got an Excel sheet. That, uh, and could you go to the slide number 47? Michaela, you mentioned that the fasteners, fasteners will, not, will not shear, but I didn't see any uh, fastener analysis. Did you guys perform some analysis to make I sure did that? just a preliminary one. I mostly had time for ANSYS model and what was going out of it, and I looked at the specs of the plastic that I was looking at. Uh, just a brief presentation that I never got to a full one, which is on my agenda. KN is a variable we call Naru's game. <laughs> it is a number we multiply the required angle by in case the, de the assumptions we use don't actually work out. <laughs> you guys have put some okay. sort of fun? <laughs> Comments. Well done. Um, I actually just have a comment. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, I just noticed a few times uh, several of you referred to I. You guys are a team, so you, you succeed together and you fail together. So probably should avoid saying I did this and I did that. You should probably stick with the we because you are a team and everything you do affects everyone else on your team. Well, thank you for the comment.